And we have joining us now Deborah Lucero, Supervisor for Butte County District 2, Tammy Ritter, Supervisor for Butte County District 3, and Bruce Ross, who is District Director for, for First Senator Brian Dolly. So we'll let you all get an opportunity to get your mics going and your cameras on if you desire. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi there. I think we're all mic'd and camera Excellent. That's what we want to see. Thank you so much. Oh, it's just so exciting to have you all here with us. Bruce, this is probably your second or third time joining in. And you're always such a trooper. We know how busy you all are, but we're so appreciative that you came online with us today. You know, we've been talking about the master plan for aging uh, for a couple of hours now today. And there are several states actually that are in various stages of implementing master plans. Now, California is the largest state with a master plan for aging and just one of five that are actually fully in motion throughout the nation. So there are a few other states, Colorado, Connecticut, Minnesota, Washington, but everybody's eye is on California because they're saying the reforms that we're making will probably most likely be mirrored throughout other states that are kind of just getting this going for themselves. Now, there's also the element that we understand there's not going to be any single policy or program that can prepare us for the changes that are coming into our state. If we just think even about the demographic shifts, the aging of our population, you know, this cohort of older adults coming in is more likely to be not married, single, by choice, most likely more ethnically diverse, living alone, and living in poverty. So as you each come in introducing yourselves, the first thing on our mind when we think about the combination of programs and services that will be required, we'd like to hear your individual perspectives. Now that this plan is here in California, how can we begin to prepare for this together? Whether we're young or old, whether we're public sector, private sector, um, let's just go in alphabetical order by name. Um, let's have you pop in first, Bruce, and then we'll follow that with Deborah and Tammy. Um, well, great. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I, good to be on a Zoom. Look forward to doing these kinds of things in person again uh, sometime soon. And uh, great to see Deborah Lucero and Tammy Ritter. Uh, nice to see you too, box, Bruce. That big. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I'll share just a little bit, uh, you know, some of the things that were very striking as I reviewed the master plan and kind of thought about how it fits with some, um, some of the things that we see and, and where there are real needs and kind of where there are issues that need to be taken a little, a little further on a community level. You know, we're not um, in, a, in a state legislator's office, we're not a social service office, um, but at the same time, people wander into our, our, cross our doors with problems, especially in the district office where I work. Um, so we do a lot of constituent casework um, that touches in a lot of uh, different and interesting areas. And I mean, one of the really heartbreaking and troubling things we see, you know, there's a lot of homelessness in California. Uh, it is shocking when you see um, homeless seniors who are not, uh, they're not paupers, they're not penniless, they often have social, some income from social security, they'll often have some resources, uh, but they're still living in their car because the, you know, where you have, um, you know, if you, if you, what social security provides, um, if you're kind of at that, at that baseline kind of minimum level it provides, uh, is, is far below what you need to pay the rent in, in even a, a more affordable part of California, like, like up in the North state. Um, it, it just is like the math just doesn't work. And we've had, um, we've had some really difficult cases where we've worked with, um, seniors who came, uh, from out of state to live, uh, one that I'm thinking of in the Reading area. Uh, she came here to live with her son. Um, she was in her 70s, and when she got here, it turned out her son had moved and didn't have a place for her. Um, and she ended up at the Good News Rescue Mission, and she um, managed to find herself a room and board situation. 
where there was one room and board and it was literally every penny of her income except for $50 a month um, for that, for a, a room and, and food. Um, and so the, the, it's, it's shocking to end up at that point in life when you're, you know, uh, I mean, you, you, you can do something till you die, but sometimes people have, people have uh, disabilities associated with aging. Um, people have, you know, cognitive problems that, you know, or, or just simple physical problems that, or they're just, they're just tired. They can't, they can't, they can't get a job anymore. Maybe can't drive anymore. Um, and it's a, it's a really shockingly difficult situation. Um, so one of the things that I was very hard to see is the very strong focus on housing um, as part of the master plan on aging. I think that housing and affordable housing for seniors um, is, is a really key aspect um, and I think that right now, what we see, the state has gotten the last several years, uh, kind of gotten religion about spending a, a substantial amount of money, putting it into the pipeline for affordable housing. Um, how it is steered tends to be very project driven based on where there's a developer that wants to do it. Um, and sometimes that really is difficult and fails your smaller rural communities because they don't necessarily have developers that are looking to develop in, um, I mean, forget Reading or Chico, but we're talking in places like, you know, Susanville or Alturas or, or Fort Jones in the Scott Valley of, of um, Siskiyou County, where there are definitely seniors who are maybe are aging out of houses that they, they, you know, really are in the position to keep living in and need some kind of more affordable situation to be sustainable over the long run. Um, but nobody's doing that work to develop that housing because it, it, it's, it's very labor intensive. It's very, it, you, you need some expertise and capital. Um, and I think that some discussion about how communities can, can recruit developers, can recruit those nonprofit groups to, to, to get to work in those communities is a real goal that um, needs to be done. How, that, how at a state level, frankly, how these programs can be altered to more effectively serve smaller communities is something that um, is, is of high interest to us. And, I'd stop talking and move on. Who's next? No, 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 absolutely. You, you bring up some very valid points, um, Bruce. And one of the things that I was just speaking about with another colleague this past week was the understanding that, especially in these northern areas, we don't even have the laborers in our area anymore because they're getting paid more down in some of these other developing regions. So now you have the developers getting through red tape and if they get through the red tape, not having the labor force to work with the extremely affordable housing. So thank you for bringing voice to that. We greatly appreciate that. Um, let's see, Deborah. let's hear your thoughts. Well, first of all, thank you for having me back. Um, is um, always a very enjoyable uh, conference for me. I always learn so much and am educated by all the speakers on all these various topics that are very close to my heart. Um, last year, I shared a bit on a personal note about my mother who um, lives with me. Uh, she thinks she still lives at her house in Corning and um, she does during the day uh, we actually drive her over to Corning so she can stay at her house during the day. And we have um, a caregiver come in eight hours a day. And then we drive over and pick her up and she stands, spends the night with us and all the weekend time with us. At 82, this is hard on her. Um, she wants to be at her house. Um, and she thinks every time we pick her up, it's the weekend. Um, she suffers from um, dementia and caused mostly by uh, her heart condition. Um, just not getting enough oxygen to her brain is what they think. Um, and, you know, she is much better off than most people in the North State uh, because she had a plan in place um, and because uh, that plan is helping us care for her. But it literally takes myself and my two sisters, one who lives in Oregon and one who lives in Texas to help my mom live her life. And we're just now entering a new phase where, um, you know, she's really getting to the point where I don't think it's as important for her to be at her home 
And so the possibility of her being with us full time is, is quite possible, which leaves us with the whole um, idea of opening up her home to um, a new young family that could live in Corning um, and care for that house just as she has done for almost 60 years. So um, all of the things that Bruce brought up about um, communities recruiting developers, we faced that in Chico. Um, I was always, to be honest, a little bit jealous of Reading because they were doing some affordable housing uh, projects in downtown Reading that I felt we should be doing in Chico. And I was quite impressed with how the city came together, um, businesses came together, uh, nonprofits came together to figure out how to do the tricky financing of affordable housing units, um, which as we all know is tricky and it's very difficult to get through all those hoops, but it's desperately needed. We have two really successful um, senior housing projects here in Chico um, and we need more. And, and we need, we need um, things, you know, not everybody wants to be in an apartment you know, sometimes they just want a room um, with a communal eating place. We need to think differently about how we um, house people because there are many seniors that are quite capable of caring for themselves, um, don't want to give up their independence, but they don't want an apartment and they don't want a, a yard and a house. They just need a place to sleep and care for themselves and get some food every day. So um, we need to think more expansively about what we can do. And in our rural areas, we don't have as many unused buildings or you know, um, hotels that are going unused. Um, you know, we, we just don't have that. So um, I, I would like to see us work more regionally on these issues. I would love to see Redding and Chico working collaboratively uh, working through our state legislators and um, our congressmen to look at through a lens of regionalism on this master plan for aging. Uh, the person who cares for my mother lives um, in Corning. She just because that would, we just lucked out on that, but she just moved to Chico. So um, it's hard to find caregivers in these small communities, Los Molinos. Corny, you know, um, all these little tiny hamlets, if you will, that, that don't have the same level of care that we need. Um, and that affects uh, the system. Uh, obviously, IHSS is extremely important. Um, we need uh, IHSS, in my opinion, to expand. I was excited to hear uh, the previous speaker talking about that system and actually moving those folks who want to into higher levels of care and training, that's exciting. We, yeah. we definitely need that. So um, those are kind of my observations right now. I mean, obviously this is a complicated issue. It's gonna take local, state and federal partners to make things happen. Um, I don't think anybody should be living on the street um, and, but it really concerns me when I see people over 65 with health issues, like our previous speakers, uh, who don't, you know, on top of their own health issues, have to worry about where they're going to be living that night. So it's heartbreaking. And we're better than this. We are better than this as a society, and we can get there. But it's going to take all of us working together. And, and we need more cooperation between cities and counties. And, and counties and counties and the state and the federal government and all of us really pulling together locally to make the North State the most beautiful place that we live, but one that where people don't have to feel isolated either because of a disability or because of their age. So I will pass it on to my very wonderful partner in all of this, um, Supervisor Ritter, who has a deep background and I much respect her knowledge of this entire area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. The floor is yours. <laughs> Let's get your mic back on. Hold on one second. There you go. 
<laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm um, not sure what there is to say following Bruce and Deborah. Um, I think they hit on really all of the really important points. I think the fact that we are just um, really now um, moving into this master plan um, is a great step forward, obviously very long overdue. Um, and, you know, the speakers today have been fantastic. Um, earlier we heard from, I believe it was Debbie and Christina, and, and they were talking about this vision of, of how we kind of pull all of these things together um, instead of operating in these kind of unrelated silos to offer services that actually are really intimately connected with one another. And um, Deborah really hit on it with the IHSS piece. Um, but I, I think that the kind of larger picture of where everything fits together is this idea of prevention. And we look at prevention a lot of times through this social service lens where we are looking at, you know, the zero to five population and we have first five and we have, you know, our passages advisory board and a behavioral health board and we have all these social services that are very much um, operating from different funding sources and are not necessarily linked together in ways that are beneficial. And kind of the um, example that I used to give a lot when I worked um, directing the Torres shelter was that if we do not address issues before they become a crisis, we end up um, needing so many more resources to address that issue once we're in crisis mode. And if you think about somebody who has a, a physical health issue like diabetes, then they need their insulin. They need their insulin properly stored and refrigerated. Um, but let's say they don't get it, right? And we know, particularly with homeless folks, um, they're gonna be on their feet a lot. Um, transportation's a major issue. And we know that we're likely to end up um, trying to assist someone who has sores on their legs and their feet um, and now we require a doctor visit, right? And at this point, we're going to require wound care, and we're going to require medications, and we're going to require, you know, addressing the potential infections that could come. And then we're going to need transportation to and from all of these appointments. So this is where I see both addressing the IHSS gap that we have um, in terms of staffing levels. It keeps us it keeps us focused on prevention. It keeps people in their homes. Um, and it keeps them out of crisis. And if we look at that from a, an even larger lens and we say, all right, let's look at this in terms of ACEs, right? And our early childhood experiences, this fits together. We know that kids that have had these adverse childhood experiences are more likely to experience physical health issues. They're more likely to experience behavioral health issues. And and then when we look at it kind of from the funding lens, right, and we look through the Department of Employment and Social Services, all of those critical services that we heard this morning um, from our supervisor, Tiffany Rowe, who was talking about, um, you know, the impacts of disasters, right, which we now have as adverse experiences, not just for children, but also for adults and leading to a lot of PTSD. We are going to have impacts with IHSS with APS, with our public guardian's office, all of these critical programs, all of which are drawing from the same pot of money and particularly negatively impacting the other programs because we don't have a large enough pot of money to adequately staff all of those programs and all of the needs. And so I think that, you know, if we look at this really from, as, as my colleague Deborah said, you know, this kind of regional approach. And then if we stop separating out, you know, the experiences that happen in childhood and the experiences that happen in adulthood and then, you know, in senior years, and we, we start to look at this as one large integrated plan, I think that we are going to be able to address the issues we're going to be able to have a better predictor of what issues are going to arise, and we're going to know how to budget for those issues in advance. So um, just like my colleagues who've already spoken, I'm, I'm all for the collaborative efforts and, and think that the presenters you've had here today have really done an excellent job of showing how related all of these topics are. Absolutely. Thank you um, very much for your opening comments. 
we, as you were voicing your comments, we did have some thoughts coming from our attendees in our Q and A and chat area. And so there is a thank you going to you, Bruce, coming from Frances Cole Boyd. And she voices, thank you, Bruce, working at for a senior affordable housing community. I agree housing is important. There is also a huge problem with the gap in housing for older adults who need a higher level of care than independent living and are not appropriate for skilled nursing, um, for long-term skilled nursing, which Medi-Cal covers. So this is a challenge, obviously, for our communities uh, with the cost of living and what is covered, you know, to be able to go into a skilled nursing facility. So um, she continues that, of course, this long-term skilled nursing, which Medi-Cal covers, IHSS does not cover 24-7 care. Um, affordable housing apartments do not provide meals or medical care. Assisted living would be appropriate, but it's not um, available as insurance does not pay for it. So you see that loop of services where there are challenges there. Um, it's private pay, but typically assisted living is going to start at about $3,500 a month. Obviously, low-income seniors can't pay that. Um, any thoughts to Francis uh, sharing here from, from all of you? Well, you know, and a couple things. You know, when IHSS does not cover 24-7 care, did it jog my memory? Did it used to at one point, and that was pulled back? I know that uh, my, some, of my, some of my colleagues have had uh, arguments with, with uh, you know, on behalf of families over, you know, the hours that are covered. Did, 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 is there somebody that knows it, that? It was available for those that required extreme care. So think basically on a hospice level where that might yeah. come in. But so, just to clarify too, um, I, I just want to add this caveat on that. My mom is physically, she can do anything physically, but she can't be left alone for more than 20 minutes right. because of her short term memory. Right. So even, even if they are physically able to care for themselves, there are other dangerous situations, you know, that require 24 hour care. Yeah. And Absolutely. I mean, I think at some point we're all, uh, we're probably all of, of a generation where we have uh, elders in our lives who uh, are trying to experience this or have, you know, friends and neighbors. And it's, um, you know, one of the things there, you know, IHSS is kind of interesting because when you get into things like, you know, hours of care, particularly uh, in your smaller communities and particularly as, as your whole society of aging, I mean, one of the things that you see when you talk about the, the average age of California and what it's going to be in 2030 or 2035 and, and the future projections, well, all of our rural counties, they're already there. They're already way past that. Um, the, 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 the skew up, up in these counties is, is older. Maybe not in Butte County because you have college no, students. But, and, anyway, um, depend on the community. But, you know, and, and just getting IHS worker, IHSS workers can be, can be challenging, even if you've got your hours approved. Like, okay, well, you still have to find somebody. And good right. luck with that, depending on where you live. And, you know, 24-7 care, you have to have that many people who you can trust reliably to show up um, and that's not a simple thing um, you know and, and it, it, it literally is I mean it can be as a, as a family member Deborah you, it's, it's a very big life commitment to be caring for somebody like that and you have to have a human who's willing and able to do it and who's not already in that position so that's um, and at some point when you're when you're when you're you're, you're just, you get your demographics kind of out of whack. And it's like, well, who's going to, who's going to be the people who are going to do that? Right. Uh, when you have, you know, millions of very older people. Um, I would say though about the, the meal thing, I am aware of at least one affordable housing, senior affordable housing complex that uh, has provided meals. I mean, I think you can, you can get into, it, it's not normal, it's not conventional, but you can get into some creative developments. And I think that's, that, you know, where you have good social, you know, good, good agencies that, that kind of understand what the needs are and are willing to, to get outside the box. You can do some cool things. Um, uh, how you pay for it, 
That's the big uh, burrito, uh, right? You know, How do you it, pay it's for it? simple. But thing, things can be done. And I Absolutely. think that the, we shouldn't downplay, you know, there are a lot of incredible programs, right? We have yeah. Meals on Wheels, we have mm -hmm. the Community Action Agency, even, um, uh, you know, uh, Bruce, from your office, Dolly has, has worked to get us numerous USDA grants for, um, for food distribution mm -hmm. um, in Butte County, and I know has done, um, you know, throughout the state. And so there are, there are resources um, but one of the things that we continually talk about, especially when we're talking about um, housing and food insecurity, is that we don't have these kind of robust networks that are set up so that everyone knows what all of the kind of options and resources are that are out there and when they operate and how they operate and if there is a uh, financial threshold you have to meet or what you need in order to obtain it or if they drop off or you have to pick up right and so having all of the information kind of centralized the way that we are um, moving into doing with housing and having a kind of central intake point I think is going to be a really important piece of addressing that food insecurity and and making sure that um, you know folks aren't going um, and skipping meals or taking medication without eating meals, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of other impacts besides just hunger that we're gonna see. Absolutely. And to kind of address the earlier point, um, I, I think we're, we're going to need to see a change in the way in which um, we kind of do housing, right? And we, we moved, you know, in the last century, very much into these kind of independent, you know, every family lives by themselves, and it's not multi-generational. And now we're seeing a move back, right, as we are taking care of our kids and starting to have to take care of our parents, and we're seeing multi-generational households. It doesn't necessarily have to be folks who are related, right? And we have some programs that have been springing up that are linking together um, seniors or individuals with disabilities who need some assistance and college students who need more affordable housing and they need a room to rent. And so there have been some really incredible programs that have come out of, um, you know, essentially what is a crisis. Um, and now I think we need to kind of weave it all together so that we are aware of all of the resources that are out there so that we can best help people to access them. And, and that's what 211 um, really is serving for. Um, or as for our county. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Go ahead. Was that you coming in, Deborah? Yeah, I was just going to go back to a point that um, Tammy made about um, prevention. You know, um, one of the things that I think we really could work on as government is when we, you know, be, through COVID, this has given us a new um, paradigm. Like we know when people's utilities get turned off, that that is a clue that that person may become unhoused. And, and through COVID, you know, we have been able to say, no, we're not going to put people out on the street because they can't pay their water bill or their electric bill. But all of that's going to come to an end at some point. But my point is, does it need to? Can we, can we get alerts, um, you know, uh, somehow through the utility function, either through water or electric, to understand when someone may be coming um, housing insecure uh, as, as a first step, you know? Um, I just think we could do things along those lines. Like in the chat, I noticed, um, ARC had said that uh, ARC of Butte County, they have a scary, and this is a quote, scary number of clients who are facing homelessness or who are crucial to address the housing needs of the disabled population, most of whom depend on social security benefits, which have not increased as the cost of living in our community has skyrocketed. And this is true. And, and now we know because of COVID, the price of food has gone up at least four to eight percent depending on where you live so absolutely what you know these are things that i believe government has a critical role in you know when it comes to utilities when it comes to ensuring um food security for people and housing as a right mm -hmm. um so 
it, because it affects, as, as Tammy pointed out, if we don't deal with the problem up front, it becomes a multiplying effect down the line because we know that people that are on the street for any length of time have more health issues, you know, then they have other issues that spring up and, and in about two years, their mental health can decline. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for bringing in that comment from um, Lisa West. And Diane um, Puckett is following up that same thread, Deborah, by saying relative to um, Lisa West's comment that combining IHSS with adult day health care, such as is provided um, in Chico for Butte, Glen, and Tehama counties through agencies like the Peg Taylor Center, and which can be paid through Medi-Cal can address a broad range of needs for how many low income, for many low income adults. And this can also help to meet many of the needs just described by Supervisors Ritter and Lucero. So I, I agree with what you were voicing Supervisor Ritter about there are programs out there. For example, um, one that I know of with uh, called House and Home here in mm -hmm. Boone County, matching up families um, with individuals who are looking for maybe a room to rent and go, and having assistance with that whole interview process to make sure that it goes smoothly when you're combining uh, total strangers into one household. So there are good programs there. Um, and that is all part of what the goals of that master plan for aging are all about uh, increasing things like the assisted living waivers. And that was mentioned by Tatiana in our chat area. So, you know, protective supervision, it's about taking part in the programs that matters. We also um, give a nod to the reality of our rural counties where you have seniors who live in areas where these programs just can't viably reach them. So, for example, if you have a senior who's living up by the lake in Megalia because they've been up there for 50 years and everybody burned down around them, but they're still in their home, and suddenly they are very isolated, very mm -hmm. isolated in a community where they weren't two years ago. So there's growth for that transformation, and yet I think an agency like an Aging and Disability Resource Center brings all of that collective information into one place more efficiently, more effectively. Uh, two more messages coming in, so you guys are popular. <laughs> so uh, the Village Movement, Tatiana coming in again saying the Village Movement has been very successful in certain areas and the expansion of congregate living can help with housing. In addition, the PACE model of housing may be expanding. So as we come into our last few minutes, can you for, each for give a, some, go ahead, Bruce. I was gonna say for, a, for, would it be possible to elaborate on what those are? I think it can be, can you? Absolutely, Tatiana, I think what we'll do, if you, if you could just briefly come in, we're gonna give you some mic privileges here. Uh, let me go up to where you are, if I can find you in our thread here. Um, Tatiana works with our uh, our high cap organization. I'm going to get some help from my tech assistant here. Give me just a moment. Sorry if I'm I'm messing up your protocols, but I... <laughs> oh, not not at all, Bruce. We're welcome to have our our um, attendants come in. We were recording, so we wanted to make sure no one's uh, cat was or dog was interfering in the background. So. <laughs> Okay, Tatiana, I think I am. I think you're now. on now, Tatiana. Perfect. Thank you. Can you, okay, um, great. Can you give some you clarity know, so, to this? Uh, because I'm also working on the statewide efforts of the uh, Master Plan on Aging and, and, and a couple of stakeholder committees. Okay, um, the congregate living would be a model such as what we have here in Chico with um, uh, well, we've got two or three of them here, one on Cohasset, and then we've got uh, where you, you live in your own little apartment, but yet you can join for a meal. Uh, you could hire perhaps somebody to help you with some of your ADLs, your activities of daily living. But that requires, obviously, a developer or a corporation to invest in that. 
Sycamore Glen is one of the examples. And uh, the assisted living waiver, it's limited in California, but it provides for Medi-Cal dollars to pay for assisted living. And there are limited slots and part of the master plan on aging and, the, and it, there is the, uh, the, the uh, effort, I suppose, and it requires either policy or legislative effort. And obviously it's gonna require funding because when you increase assisted living waivers, you've got to find the providers that are going to be willing to accept Medi-Cal as a payment. And we know that Medi-Cal pays far below what the market rate is. Um, the PACE program is an amazing model. It's called the Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. Uh, on lock in the San Francisco Bay Area has that. Uh, there is an on lock, I think, also in North Sacramento. So if you go on to the, you know, do a Google for PACE and go on their website, you will see it is an excellent supportive living um, uh, complex where you actually are living in a congregate setting. You may have your own apartments or it is definitely a development. Um, Life Steps, that would be something good for you for a future conference. Life Steps is an amazing uh, organization. It's a nonprofit that has actually built supportive living uh, communities in the Bay Area and in Sacramento that includes, and they just got legislative approval, to have uh, a, uh, a nurse available. These are independent, but it supports what we call the trapped in the gap. Those that are not fully eligible for Medi-Cal because of income, but yet they don't have enough money to pay for um, you know, assisted living or, or maybe even a senior community such as we have in Sierra Sunrise, which I think is called something else. So I help people all the time trying to figure out how are they going to move from their life stages. And the planning, I think that that, Tammy, I think mentioned that, it's got to start from the very beginning. You've got to educate schools, you've got to educate at the college level, you've got to educate at the uh, at the employer level. How prepared are you for your uh, life steps as you go through the years? Because it, it is, it's a work in progress, but there are certain areas of California. I think that in New England, they've got an amazing uh, um, village movement there too, where you have uh, people in the community. For example, if you were to live in a complex that has they're all independent, but that community is aging. So now you can bank volunteer dollars uh, or volunteer hours. Okay, you've got to have an administrator, but how do I find somebody to fix uh, or replace my doorknob? Or maybe I've got a roof leak and so forth. You want to remain in the home, but now you have resources right there available. So, uh, Entities such as the Hignal Corporation or others that have developments all over, they could be, they could be creating a village movement. Absolutely. Thank you so much Thank for you. bringing some clarity to that. Please go Thank ahead, you. Supervisor Ross. Let's give us some closing thoughts from all of you on this. Well, I was, I, um, I'll just, I'll follow Tatiana, um, although that's a, that's a hard act to follow. Um, that's all incredible information. As, as Tatiana was talking, I was thinking about how we are doing things on such a small scale. Um, you probably have all heard about Everheart Village, which is moving forward as a partnership with CHAT and the county, where we are going to be addressing senior homelessness for individuals who have behavioral health issues on uh, you know, a very similar kind of tiny house village approach um, with centralized services and also with wraparound services um, with Butte County Department of Behavioral Health. And I think that having these kind of smaller programs um, is what's going to really make it manageable. It's going to actually feel like home. So it's gonna be a place that people want to be. 
Um, we just need it on such a larger scale. And the, the impact that they think we can have, you know, here on the local county level and, and even on the city level is that I think a lot of it has to do with zoning and, and code changes in that we need to, you know, especially as we're moving forward with this, this plan for California, we need to be the leaders. We need to be coming up with these innovative approaches um, for how we can get more housing onto these um, kind of smaller footprints. We need to be having more of the kind of granny housing, the mother-in-law units, um, and all of those requirements that we have been so um, kind of saddled to for so long in that it has to have, you know, running water or it has to have a kitchen or that we can't centralize those particular services, I think that is, that's what's getting in our way. Because there are a lot of folks, as, as Tatiana referenced, you know, the trapped and the gapped where they don't qualify for this, but they don't make enough for the other. And, and that's the folks that we need to be having, you know, these little cottages and these tiny homes and, you know, that Every time we put restrictions on how folks are able to use their own property um, to address these kinds of issues, I, I think we take a step backwards. So that's where I feel like there really can be some local control. And then on the state level, um, you know, you can you can let Dolly know. Uh, we we really we we need a champion. We need a housing champion to be saying that if we are going to address this, especially in a community like Butte where we have lost so much of what was our affordable housing base, then we need creative approaches. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Um, thoughts I'll, from I'll, I'll Supervisor I'll just jump Ross. on that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's fascinating. There are, uh, and, and agree entirely about some of the stuff where, where zoning has become its own enemy uh, of housing issues. And, so in the state right now, the Senate just passed um, SB9 and SB10, which do a couple things. One of them, uh, 10, I believe is the one that it allows, you can build a second unit on any single family zoned area, uh, and you can do a lot split on any single family home lot, like just, just one. And um, like, it's a very modest, it's very organic. It will allow, I mean, we foresee a lot of potential, you talk about multi-general housing, like you could build a second unit because, you know, you don't want to live with people, but you know, it's good to be close by. Right. Well, sure, that's perfect. Um, you know, and it's amazing to see some of the opposition erupt around that um, very passionately and frankly from both, uh, both ends of the political spectrum. Um, I've gotten emails that echo each other from fascinatingly people who would disagree about everything else, but <laughs> they never want to see that second unit in single family zone. Um, so, uh, I think, but definitely getting some kind of organic flexibility in there and what people are allowed to do with their own property doesn't seem controversial to Brian Daly as a, as a Republican guy, but um, uh, that, that, those issues can be very hard. People, people value their neighborhoods and their property a lot, um, but they have different, different, different views of what that means for what other people can do with their property. Um, Absolutely. Anyway. One more quick question coming in from our attendees. Rosa Deming is asking if any of you have information on any housing development projects going on for Paradise Megalia area. I'll take you off mute there, Deborah. I see you coming uh, in. There you go. Yeah, um, I was just gonna say, yeah, we have some um, multifamily housing units that are going back into Paradise. Um, as you know, uh, the affordable housing that we did have in Butte County was very much located up on the ridge. And um, the, the issue that they're facing is the um, lack of, of sewer treatment up on the ridge and getting things back online. The proposal that is going through right now is for $180 million regionalization of the Paradise Sewer Line and Chico Sewer Treatment Plant. Mm -hmm. Personally, I believe, and that's a five to 10 year out project. That's from the proponent's mouth. Wow. Personally, I believe that we could do it much quicker if we decentralized the treatment facility, did a rewater reuse up on the ridge, kept mm -hmm. that 
water up there to create green belts to help with fire suppression and create a, a more sustainable area. Um, I'm not sure why the state is forcing um, this issue of regionalization, but it is being forced by the State Water Quality Control Board. And um, I see a much quicker solution in doing a decentralized um, plant. Those could get up and running with very little permitting because there is not a lot of people living up on the ridge, particularly in paradise right now. Right. So, um, you know, it, it, it would be a quicker way to get more housing built more quickly because it's, a, it's an issue. You can't build multifamily housing units without sewer. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so yeah, it's and, a big and giving and giving a nod to Tammy's comment coming in um, with what you're voicing, Supervisor Lucero. Uh, Supervisor Ritter, do you want to come in as we close out? Because I think this is a really key um, element and thought to digest as we walk away from today's conversation. You know, building environments, that's what we see on the screen there. This goes mm -hmm. way beyond houses. This is building environments. Um, your thoughts, Supervisor Ritter? Well, I was actually responding to uh, Tatiana, who were saying, um, you know, a really good point that planners have to be cognizant of the drought and water shortages. Mm -hmm. um, but my response was that that is a lot more relevant to our ag community than it is actually to housing development, as there's plenty of surface water that exists up on the ridge. Um, you know, it's more an issue of infrastructure, as um, Supervisor Lucero was saying. And, and especially if we're talking about developing affordable housing in the area where we lost the vast majority and where we, we actually need to see a rebuild, um, it, it's really gonna depend upon that infrastructure being there. And there have been multiple very um, uh, well-researched and um, appropriate um, plans drawn up um, to to address the, the infrastructure needs. But again, if we wait to do it all at one time, then we are going to wait to be putting in the affordable housing units that we need for a very long time. Um, and we should be doing it as we can um, because we still have so many people that are displaced from the campfire. Absolutely. And I believe and the word that you both used was creative earlier in the conversation. Yes. And Chico, you know, I mean, is really not affordable. You know, I mean, there it, it is. I just, um, the gal I was talking about that was helping my mom, she just moved back. Well, she moved to Chico. She can't afford anything more. I mean, she's looked carefully at her finances. She is a home care health giver. She can't afford anything more than $625 a month. That's wow. it. Wow. Okay, so um, with everything else that she has to do with school and with gas and with everything that she's doing, so so she has three other roommates. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's how it works. Wow. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I wish we had another two hours just to keep the conversation going with you, but we are immensely heart grateful that you took time to be here with our attendees today. So Supervisors Ritter, Ross, and Lucero, our heart is with you. This is our community. We're here to make it better. Thank you for being on that campground. We appreciate Thanks for having it. us. Thanks for all Thanks. you're doing. Pleasure.